If you're an entrepreneur, you know what it means to take personal and financial risks, create jobs that support your community, and devote most of your time to your business. But do you know how to plan for a successful exit from your business? Do you know who should be involved in creating your succession or transition plan and the steps along the way? Welcome to Finish Big, the podcast with Mark Dorman from Legacy Business Advisors. The podcast theme is inspired by critically acclaimed business author, Bo Burlingham, author of Finish Big, how great entrepreneurs exit their companies on top. In this podcast, you'll hear success stories of exit plans done right and pick up practical tips based on years of legacy business advisors' expertise and knowledge about the largest and most important financial transaction of your life. Now, on to the show. Good day. This is Mark Dorman, your host of the Finish Big podcast. And today I am uh, joined by uh, terrific guest, Robert Brant Hammer. Uh, Brant Hammer was born in Elkins, West Virginia, and currently resides in Morgantown. He's a finance professor at the West Virginia or WVU University in Morgantown. At Morgantown, he earned both his undergraduate and master's in finance with over eight years of experience in the commercial banking and consulting business. He's developed an expertise in business valuation, corporate finance, banking, disruptive technology, uh, disrupted financial technology, I should say. We're going to dig into that, Brant. Credit risk management portfolio management and bitcoin he's also a management of the risk uh, a member of the risk management association in his teaching role at wvu brant has taught a wide array of courses including applied investment management advanced bank management real estate introduction to investing financial institutions corporate finance personal financial planning and business valuation in addition to that he's covered courses on macroeconomics business finance healthcare financial management, and financial technology. His teaching spans both undergraduate and master's level courses. It's a perfect fit for this podcast, folks. Brant serves as a faculty advisor for the acclaimed University Smith Managed Investment Fund, or SMIF, Smith, overseeing the student's management of a half a million dollar investment portfolio and sits on the finance undergraduate and MBA program curriculum committees at WVU. Outside of teaching, Brant actively writes an investing in macroeconomics-focused newsletter named Capital Notes. We'll talk about that, which reflects his passion for the subject. His goal is to grow this newsletter rapidly over the next two years with a target of 10,000 subscribers. As I mentioned, Brant lives in Morgantown with his wife and two-year-old son. They enjoy spending time together, hanging out on their family farm, boating at Tiger Lake State Park and pretending to be Spider-Man. We'll have to talk about that. Brand Hammer, welcome to Finish Big, the podcast. Thanks, Mark. It's uh, uh, great to be here. Uh, well, happy thank to you. do it. Yep. Thank you. We uh, are delighted to have you. Just by way of uh, give the, our listeners some background here. So Brant actually was my youngest son, Ian's college professor. And uh, as Ian has kind of followed the uh, the progress of the Finish Big podcast, he says, hey, Pops, I think I've got a really good guest for you. Uh, and I said, well, I'm not really looking for the academia type here, son. He says, no, 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 <laughs> this guy, this guy is, uh, is, is, is a capital markets expert, corporate finance, banking, et cetera. And when we talked, I said, boy, perfect fit, given particularly as we started uh, folks talking about having Brand on the show it was, you know, the, the, the rising interest rate environments. I said, boy, this could really, really get interesting. So let's just get started. Brent, as I read your bio and I was preparing for our show today, uh, last evening, uh, you spent quite a few years in uh, the private sector. Tell us about that. You were doing banking and consulting. How long did you do that? Uh, that was immediate after graduating from WVU? Yeah, so I uh, I actually graduated during the financial crisis during during the worst of it, probably the worst time in the world to graduate with a finance degree. Couldn't find a job really anywhere, um, and actually went back to school briefly for industrial engineering. And so I have a little bit of that background. But while I was doing that, uh, applied to basically any bank that I could uh, think of, and and eventually landed a role there in two thousand nine, two thousand late two thousand nine. And um, 
while I was looking, actually also started this consulting piece of my career where it was also focused on credit, uh, more or less like uh, extending credit to suppliers um, or suppliers extending credit to their customers through, uh, you know, kind of accounts payable management, if you will, mm -hmm. um, which kind of helped with banking. And then with banking, it was almost all entirely commercial credit uh, focused uh, career, starting at the transactional level, looking at individual transactions, building up in sizes uh, to the point where ended up finishing my banking career, um, lo looking at m mostly involved with the larger deals and then the overall credit portfolio management. And again, this is mostly commercial deals, so business uh, focused. And so that's really where I learned to apply the trade of analyzing financial statements, uh, managing a portfolio, managing risk, interest rate risk, mm -hmm. what makes rates go up and down, so on and so forth. And I would say my career was actually in a very uncommon market. This was post GFC interest rates at zero, um, probably uh, one of the easiest environments. Post, uh, post GFC global financial crisis. Correct? Yes. Uh, one, one of the easiest environments, I would say, for banks to make money. I, I think that's one of the reasons why we had our re our recent banking crisis is because when when you have a decade of zero percent rates and it's super easy to make money, you can get a spread on anything. Uh, people forget how to manage risk. They forget interest rates can actually go up, that those spreads can actually go to zero or even go negative. Yeah. And uh, you know, we we can talk more about that when we when we kind of get to that point. If you want yeah, to talk so, about Yeah, so. Yeah, I, I, I echo those sentiments exactly. We talked to our clients, our business owner clients. I said, well, you know, inflation could rear its ugly head. This was two years ago. They said inflation. We haven't seen inflation since Jimmy Carter. I said, mm -hmm. no, that's it. It's been it's been more recent than that. But certainly uh, it had paused. But so walk us through. So you were in the banking consulting business. But what prompted you to come back into becoming uh, a finance professor at WVU? Yeah, so uh, the, the bank I was working for was also in Morgantown, where, where WVU is headquartered. And uh, while at WVU, I'd made a great relationship with a number of my professors, working with them on research. And in 2014, uh, the, the chair of the finance department at WVU was looking for somebody to fill a class that essentially nobody wanted to teach, right? So when nobody wants to teach something, you go find uh, an adjunct to step in and, and teach it largely because it was at six o'clock at night. Right. So I, I get the a, adjunct who decides to go into the banking business during the financial crisis. Yeah. So you, you find the only person that, that you think will say yes in the uh, entire city. And so they reached out to me and I got started doing that and taught one class a semester from uh, 2014 to 2019. And then they asked me to come on full time and uh, they kind of caught me at a, a perfect time where I was kind of at the peak of where I could go at the bank I was at without retirements uh or, or or whatnot above me and uh so it felt like a good a good time to step out of that and and into a, a new career that honestly i like better less stress you know yeah 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 so uh let, let's move into it walk us through some of the current courses that you're teaching and in this environment i mean not only do we have you know very disruptive interest rate environment we've got credit tightening I mean, kind of mm -hmm. give us your high level overview of where you see the US economy today the, the domestic markets today as well as the overall global economic markets so i know the listeners can't see my screen uh, mark but i i'm, I'm going to share my screen with you just so me and you have something uh to look at maybe it'll prompt some questions from you what you should be able to see and i think this is what really everything is revolving around now is the direction of, of rates and inflation. The direction of rates and uh, inflation are also impacting growth. And so I, I think the, what everybody cares about is, is really those three things. And, and really, you could boil it down to just inflation and growth. Obviously, the response that uh, rates have had by, you know, this is the 30-year yield going from 1.19% in July of 2020, up now to 4.4%. Uh, is a response to the Fed raising rates. Fed raising rates due to the uh, rapid increase in inflation that was caused by the response to the uh, to the pandemic, and uh, so now the the discussion is okay. Where has inflation peaked? 
Is it truly uh, coming back down? Is it going to remain sticky around 3%? Um, or are we going to uh, go right back to their target? You know, Powell came out in Jackson Hole in July and, and reaffirmed the fact that uh, there was kind of a little bit of kicking around as to whether potentially maybe they should raise the target from two to three. You know, if you raise it from two to three, all of a sudden, you know, job done, we can stop raising rates, all will be well, maybe we'll even start cutting them again. But Powell came out and reaffirmed uh, the fact that he does want to get it down to two. And so that's kind of the, the, the discussion that needs to be had is, okay, well, what is it going to take to actually get it down to two? Depending on what measures of inflation you look at, some of them suggest that we're on the right track. We will be there soon. There is a measure right now, if uh, listeners uh, want to check it out, it's called Trueflation, T-R-U-F-L-A-T-I-O-N.com. Trueflation is kind of a day-to-day -day snapshot. It's kind of this new methodology that was come up with to try to track prices in real time, actual prices paid by people, as opposed to this CPI methodology that uh, the Fed uses. It says that we're at 2.62% right now, so almost back down to the Fed's target. If you look at the CPI, we actually just ticked up um, over the last... Uh, over the last month, we've actually, over the last two months, we've actually gone from three back up to 3.7. So we're actually heading in the wrong direction. If you use that measure, the Fed cares about something called PCE, which is even uh, a little bit stickier above uh, 3.7, right around 4%. And that's what they want to get back to two. So if you ask me kind of what's going on right now, I, I would say that there's a bit of a disconnect between what in my opinion, the markets, say the equity market and, and private markets are pricing in and what the Fed is seeing and likely to do. I think the Fed is likely to stay tighter for longer, uh, maybe even raise again, not this meeting, but potentially the next meeting. That's what you can see right here. This is, it's called the CME Fed Watch Tool. And basically it backs out of the bond market, the probability of the Fed actually hiking or cutting at a given meeting. This shows that this next meeting, which is what, tomorrow, uh, they have a 99% chance of staying where they're at now, pausing, if you will. And that's what's being priced into the markets. But uh, I think the fact that inflation seems to be a little bit sticky, oil prices are going back up again. I think we're, we're probably going to hit $100 a barrel again by the end of October, if you had to hold me to it. And as you know, when, when oil gets to 100 a barrel and people start seeing their gasoline bills go up a little bit, that is the number one thing that drives inflation expectations. The number one thing, gasoline. That's what gets people to start calling the politicians. And whether anybody wants to like, uh, like it or not or believe it or not, the Fed is not an independent institution. They do respond to political pressure. So I, I think what we're going to find is that the, that inflation getting back to 2% is going to be a hard fight. Yeah. So, so let me just uh, kind of bring you back to, I mean, finish big. Uh, and our guest today is Brant Hammer, uh, professor of finance at uh, West Virginia University in Morgantown, West Virginia. Phenomenal place, beautiful part of the country. But finish big, Brant, as you know, is all about private businesses and one of the questions that I get out in the marketplace all the time is, you know, with interest rates rising, I mean, almost two and a half percent, 250 basis points, 14 interest rate hikes over the last, what was it, 18 months, roughly? Mm -hmm. Yep. Can, the, can I still grow my business? One, these are questions that I want to go deep with you. Can, it, it, can I still afford to grow because the cost of capital has gone up? Uh, I'm no longer borrowing at 2% and now borrowing at 5 6%. Uh, secondly, the second question would be, are valuations likely to come down, right? So one of the things we talked about preparing for the show is, what is the impact of interest rate hikes, and there, I mean, pick one, there's a dozen of them, on private, uh, the private sector multiples, right? So am I likely, am I better off, am I going to get a higher valuation with higher rates? I would suspect no, because they can't lever it up, but I mean, you're the expert. Talk to us like we're really students in your class 
and what is the correlation that goes on there? Yeah, so I mean, if you if you just look at a, a standard, you know, call it a discounted cash flow valuation, which you know, in in the private world, we use a lot of comparable transactions, uh, multiple valuations, uh, relative valuations, if you will. But um, if you just use a standard, say, discounted cash flow valuation, where the value of your business is based on the discounted value of all of your expected future cash flows, then the one factor that really matters a lot in that, assuming your cash flows are held equal in the future, this forecast doesn't change based upon any uh, you know, change in outlook for the economy, then all else equal at higher interest rates, you have a lower valuation, period. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, uh, the, the situation, though, in reality is a little bit harder to uh, it's harder to pin that down and just say that that's always the case during periods of higher inflation. If you're a business that is able to pass along your cost to your customers, then you actually might experience greater cash flows because you're passing along higher prices. And therefore, the rising rates is not going to impact your valuation quite as much because your future cash flows are higher. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're one of those businesses that's able to do that, that's able, that has pricing power, then I would say the impact of higher rates for longer is not as uh, large on your valuation as, say, somebody who is going to have a lot harder time passing along costs to their customers or maybe has employees that are going to demand much higher wages. So your margins are going to get hit. So it's 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 a complex topic, but... Like I said, all else equal, higher rates means lower valuations. Yeah, I mean, and, and- high, higher rates, lower valuations, but in the environment that we're in, speaking of, let's say, private equity, there's so much, quote unquote, dry powder out there on the sidelines wanting to be deployed, but usually it's deployed and then levered up, right? So they're going to then borrow, but there still is more money than there are good deals out there, correct? I, I, I would say... Yes, there has been. I mean, there there has been a bit of a. I, I think that the, I mean, so, so the, again for the viewers, the the chart that I have on my screen right now is looking at private equity versus the overall stock market. It's the performance of private equity versus the overall market. You can see kind of these, uh, that the 2020, the COVID to uh, late 2021 period was private equity was was going nuts. The funds flowing in. Uh, people couldn't get enough. Anybody that wanted a deal done could get it done. Valuations were going through the roof. And then right there is where you start raising rates and the private equity starts underperforming. Uh, I think we're actually at a space now where because of, as you just said, Mark, the the amount of funds that are out there sitting, potentially waiting to be deployed, I think because that, that amount is so high, um, the shock of the rising rates that kind of put a lot of private equity funds and VC funds on, uh, on their back foot a little bit. A lot of people were shocked at the, the, the uh, rapid increase in rates and kind of went into wait and see mode. I have a lot of uh, uh, one of my primary connections that's in this space that does a lot of investing in PE and VC, especially he said that, uh, it seems that liquidity is starting to return a little bit. A lot of it is coming from what are called uh, uh, secondary funds, where you, you have essentially a secondary fund that's raised that is purchasing d- businesses out of a first fund. So think about like SoftBank. It's a large private equity gotcha. yeah, uh, business that yeah. yeah that just took uh, the semiconductor stock public this past week. They're raising. They're able to raise these secondary funds, and they're actually using them to provide liquidity to the initial funds, basically buying businesses out of funds that they raise maybe during COVID. Um, and so the liquidity is definitely there. Um, the problem is, is can you find businesses that are generating large enough returns that it can justify having to borrow at these increased rates? So, you know, it, it's a very complicated economic no, I mean, situation well, in my exactly. opinion. Yeah, no, I mean, this is, I mean, and this speaks to kind of the essence of Finish Big and, and, and really the, uh, the mission of this podcast or this show, if you will, is to, you know, the quicker a business owner, he or she begins to prepare their business for a successful exit, whatever that is, however that's defined for them, you know, these are 
topics that you'd think, well, what does this have to do with me if I own a $10 million manufacturing business in Cleveland, Ohio? Well, I mean, you know, it has a lot to do with the valuations that you're likely to, mm-hmm. to, uh, to receive, the suitors that you would have for your business who might be interested and what all of a sudden becomes a reasonable outcome. I mean, I'm forever just talking with our clients of, look, if you can now get five, five and a half percent on your money, where two years ago, you couldn't get one and a half percent on your money. All of a sudden, when you go to redeploy that client, that, that capital from a sale, it's in a almost riskless type short of inflation, a much less risky environment. You, you would agree with that? Yeah, I, I think the I think one thing that the the rate increase and in, in the fact that you can get these high high risk free yields on uh, money markets or high yield savings accounts or uh, T bills, I, I think one thing that that does is it change it changes people's it it kind of changes asset allocations a bit because sure. you, you have to look at risk premiums, you know, uh, during and that's kind of what you see on this chart right here during this period of time between. 2020 and late 2021, early 2022, you know, as a capital allocator, I have really nothing to lose by dumping a bunch of money into VC and PE, uh, high risk public equities, because I can't earn anything anywhere right. else. I have to chase that yield. But now we're in this position where you can get five and a half percent on a six month T bill. Bingo. So I need to earn 15% if I'm going to go out there and buy somebody's private business or invest in VC or PE funds. Um, and and it, it makes the hurdle rate for those PE and VC funds so much higher. The, the bar is raised so much more. And, and, you, and you answered my question, so thank you. But the hurdle rate is greater now with higher rates, mm-hmm. which leads then to the more prepared business owner yes. when she, he or she looks to transition when I'm looking to deploy my capital, if I'm a PE or if I'm a, if I'm a financial buyer, I need to get X plus another 5% just to get back to where I was three years ago. Uh, and therefore what our message is to our clients and, and business owners around the country is you better be de-risked and, and really spit shine, so to speak, when you mm-hmm. go to market, because there's a, there's only so many places to deploy your capital and where can I get the highest return for the least amount of risk? You, you would, you would concur with everything I've said there. 100%. Everything you just said is, is accurate. You know, like, like you just said, the higher the hurdle rate, the better you better look when you go out there to market yourself, be it for a sale, be it to go to a a bank and borrow money to sell bonds, whatever you have to do. Uh, either to exit your business or to raise capital for your business in this environment, you have to, you have to set yourself apart. You have to be the, 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 the best of the, the pack, if you will. Um, you gotta be the bell of the ball, right? Exactly. I mean, the bell be of the, the ball. Most prepared. Right, right, right. So let's, let's kind of switch subject. We appreciate that insight. And our guest today is again, Brant Hammer, finance uh, professor at WVU, West Virginia, home of the Mountaineers in Morgantown, beautiful part of the country. You must from just working with uh, my son, Ian, but he says you obviously have a passion for working with younger, uh, younger financial professionals, soon to be financial professionals. Tell us how much you enjoy that and what you enjoy most about it. I, I, I think the, you know, what, what really does it for me is seeing where they go, you know, doing, doing everything that I can to, set them up for success. I mean, the way that I think about teaching every day is what would I have wanted to learn when I was sitting in their shoes? What do I wish somebody would have told me when I was in their shoes? And uh, I don't think every everybody necessarily teaches that way. Right. And they can tell when you actually, students can easily tell when you actually have a passion for the work that you do. And uh, when, when they can tell when you're actually trying to help them meet people, get a job, step out of their shell, and do things that uh, they otherwise might not have done. And then two or three years down the road, when you get an email from somebody that says, you were the best professor I ever had. There's, I would never be in this job if it weren't for you pushing me, so on and so forth. That's what makes it all worth it. And that's what I really like, uh, really like doing. Yeah, that's great. I mean, it's, uh, I always thought the best professors for me and I'm 58 were the ones that said, Hey, 
you better sit up straight because you're going to want to know why this is important. And here's why it's important. And then when you look back, you go, mm, OK, now I get it. But this is this has been great. What did the Mountaineer fo- football program look like this year? You know, we, we looked pretty good. We just won the backyard brawl. Um, uh-huh. I, I was I was happy with that. The defense showed up. Uh, you know, and when we get out to the, when we get out and start playing the big 12 football, we're going to have to score a few more touchdowns to put some (laughs) W's on the schedule, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. I'm holding out hope. Yeah. So do you see, uh, you're looking forward, we're going heading into an election year. What do you, what do you, what, what's your forecast for the financial markets? Not that we're going to hold you to it here. You know, I, I'm a little you know, let, let, let me shout out my, my newsletter here. If, if anybody wants yeah, to see please, what I, yeah. what I, what I think, then uh, you can go to uh capital But um, out there uh, I've been, I've basically been saying that I, I think the markets have got a little bit ahead of themselves um, recently. I think the amount of liquidity in the financial system is, is uh, flat to being drained at the moment. And, and the markets have gone up kind of on this AI hype. AI is a real thing. It's going to be a big thing, but I think it is getting a little dot-com bubble-ish at the moment. Not to that extent, but we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. And I, I do think the market bottomed in October. I think that was uh, the, the major bottom for maybe the next few years. But I think that uh, we'll probably finish out the year maybe weak. And then um, I wouldn't be surprised if by third quarter of next year, we, we see an actual recession, mm-hmm. whether and that means, way. whether that means that we actually go much lower than we are now equity markets wise. I don't know, but I, I do think economy wise, we probably will see uh, a recession by the end of by election season next year. I think we'll be in one. Mm-hmm. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about the geopolitical impact of uh uh, the Russia, Russia, Ukrainian war and or China. I mean, what are your thoughts there on the global economy? So I do right now, my, my rationale at the moment for why I think equity markets are going to be a little weak is I think oil prices, right? As I said earlier, I think oil prices are going to lead to a reset in rate hike probabilities, which what that means is Higher oil prices will, will keep the Fed higher and tighter for longer, and, and I think that the market's going to price that in soon. That's largely driven by Russia, Ukraine, continued problems there, as well as expectations that China is going to start stimulus again. They're going to start some fiscal and monetary stimulus, and that would lead to more imports of oil into China, leading to further tightness. U.S. has already drained the uh, the SPR, um, our, our reserves, basically as far as we can. So we don't really have any potential response to higher oil prices at the moment. We actually have the number of oil rigs, oil drilling rigs has been falling for about the last six months mm-hmm. in the U.S. too. So our production will likely start falling again here soon. It's kind of a recipe for high oil, higher oil prices. And it's you, you also have um, Europe is actually in a recession right now, a technical recession. So yep. Likely they're going to be coming out of that here soon, or at least them coming out of it will begin to be priced into the oil market, meaning likely higher oil prices again from Europe as well. So I think it's kind of a perfect situation to keep inflation sticky around 3% and lead to uh, kind of an equity market, maybe consolidation or correction and uh, higher, higher rates potentially. So that's kind of my forecast. Well, there you have it, folks, uh, straight from not necessarily the horse's mouth, but the mountaineer's mouth, uh, mm-hmm. Dr. Professor Brant Hammer, Robert Brant Hammer of West Virginia University. Uh, you can uh, follow him on Twitter at twitter.com backslash capital notes, or you can follow his newsletter at capitalnotes.substack.com. Dr. Hammer, uh, on behalf of uh, the folks here at Finish Big and the podcast and myself, uh, and my son, Ian, who is a proud Mountaineer, I want to thank you very, very much for your time and for being on Finish Big this afternoon. Thank you, Mark. I, uh, it was great. I really appreciate the chance to uh, speak to everybody out there that uh, follows you. Your, great. Your, the, the work you're doing is, is fantastic. So I appreciate that. I appreciate that, Dr. Hammer. So uh, this is Mark Dorman, your host of the Finish Big podcast. Here's to finishing big. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed listening to Finish Big, the podcast with Mark Dorman from Legacy Business Advisors. Click the follow button to be notified when new episodes are available. 
Learn more at LegacyBusinessAdvisors.com or call 330-350-5410. Please be aware the information in these podcasts represent the views and opinions of our guests and do not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Legacy Business Advisors. The content is for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional tax or legal advice. Always seek the advice of your legal or tax professional with any questions regarding your specific situation.